Aloha, friends. So I'm going to be sharing the first anecdote about my, my journeys and my experiences with the eighth house. And my first one is really an interesting illustration about how the eighth house is about the cause of death rather than the death itself. The eighth house is a succeedant house. So it's kind of like, what comes after? So I wonder if that's why people associate it a little bit with other dimensions. Well, let's explore. Let's explore this life experience that having the ruler of my ascendant in the eighth house can possibly entail. So when I was 23, I used to work extra on the weekends for some of my clients from work um, for some cash because I, I was an intern and I needed extra cash. So this gentleman, we'll call him Mr. Frenchman. I used to go to his house every so often to do some landscaping work, maybe clean and organize his garage. He was in his 80s and very overweight and unable to take care of these things. And his wife, also in her 80s, also overweight, was um, at the beginning stages of dementia, maybe not too beginning, not very advanced, but advanced enough that it was obvious and beginning enough that it was very easy for Mr. Frenchman to take care of her at home. And that is what he did. He basically spent his entire time taking care of his wife and spent very little time taking care of, of the home. And that was why I was there working. So on this particular day, he was sitting in a chair in the garage, conducting my behaviors and actions, cleaning, et cetera. And like any normal person, he got up to go to the bathroom. And uh, this is the, I'm in the garage, so this is the wall. And if the garage door opens like this into the house, you would open the door and just right there would be the bathroom. So. So here's the garage and the bathroom is right here. So he went into the bathroom and I'm just putzing around doing my thing. And I can hear him because he is a 300 pound plus man moving around. I can hear him through the walls. And he exited the bathroom and then I heard a large thud. In fact, there was even a weird sound coming from the doorknob. So I went over to the garage door to go inside the house and see what that large thud was, but I couldn't open the garage door. The garage door opened into the house. It opened just enough that I could see what was blocking the door and it was his head. Yeah, so I opened the door into his head and I was like, oh my gosh. So the front door was locked. I had to jump the fence and go in through the sliding glass door in the back. And there he was, conscious, but confused. He didn't know he was on the floor. He didn't know how he'd gotten there. In fact, he thought he was just laying down in bed resting. And when I said, you need to get up, he's like, no, no, I'm just taking a nap. I just need to rest. Let me just catch my breath. I have a headache. I just need a moment and then I'll get up. And I'm like, oh no, no, the back of my head is going, you know, all the things that I've been taught about dealing with seniors, number one cause of death is complications from, from a fall. Um, most seniors, when they've fallen, do not want assistance. They don't want the ambulance. Um, I'm not going to get into why. I'm just going to say that that is a common trend. And that is exactly what was happening. Mr. Frenchman did not want my help. He did not think anything was wrong and he did not want me to call anyone. So my gut was do not let him lay there. If he's hit his head and he has a concussion, don't let him take a nap. 
don't let them fall asleep. So I knew that being only 150 pounds, five, seven, I was no, no way I was going to get a 300 plus man who's six, four to get him to stand up. So I thought maybe I could help him sit up. If I can get him to sit up, then maybe we can use the stairs to help him crawl into a stand and crawl and then get him up into a standing position. So I, I, he gave me his arm and I tried to help him up. And as his head began to lift a little bit, I noticed a puddle of blood under his head and I lowered him back down. And I said, Mr. Frenchman, you're bleeding. I need to call an ambulance. And he said, no, 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 I'll be fine. And at that point it was just yeah, the little internal battle, especially being young and 23. It's like, do I listen to my elders or do I do what I think I'm supposed to do? And it was just like, well, thank goodness that other elders had told me, <laughs> told me better. Don't listen to them. If they've hit their head and they say no, don't listen to them. It's like, okay, called the ambulance, unlock the front door, let them in. They had the stretcher. They got him up right away. Probably like five, five medics. Had yeah, that's how big this guy was. Five medics. They asked me an important question that I didn't have the answer to. Did I know what meds he was on? No, no, don't know. All I did was what I could do, which was point to what I could see in the house and all I could see was a kitchen table covered in dozens of prescription bottles. I didn't know if they were his or hers. I pointed him out to the, the medics. I think they might have looked at a bottle or two, set it down and moved on. There were too many. So I, I saw them put him in the back and they told me what hospital he would be at. And that was basically it. That was the last time I ever saw Mr. Frenchman. I didn't know that at the time, but I walked back into the house to realize that I was alone with the wife. She was fast asleep in her bedroom, completely unaware of what had happened. And that was when it just really started to dawn on me the importance of what I was doing there. Because what happened was probably going to happen. Mr. Frenchman went to the restroom, big deal. He ran out of toilet paper, big deal. He was trying to shuffle down the hallway to get some more. All of these things probably would have happened regardless of whether or not I was there helping clean the garage. It just so happened I was there helping to clean the garage. And so when Mr. Frenchman fell, I was able to get him immediate help. And as a result, I was able to wake up the wife and let her know what was happening. And it was very difficult because she had the early stages of dementia. And so she wanted me to call her son. Well, I, I, I knew her son had passed maybe 20 years prior. So it was a challenge to be able to um, feel comfortable going upstairs into the office to rummage through Mr. Frenchman's desk in order to get the contact information of the family. I mean, the wife had no idea. She did not know what the rest of the house looked like because she had never been up there. And all I can say was just, it was overwhelming going into that office because it was just loaded with giant Halloween 
sized variety bags of candy and chocolate. And there were piles and stacks of bags of, of new chocolate. And then there were bags and full garbage bins with the wrappers. So it was not easy finding the information that I needed. And it took many phone calls to get a hold of someone, a real person, someone outside of leaving a message. Some of those phone numbers didn't work. So many people were at work. When I finally did get a hold of someone, they were not even in the same state. The good news was they knew the family member that did live in the city. And they were able to assure me and the wife that the niece, the local niece, would be alerted and that she would come to the house and take care of her aunt. And that's what happened. And I mean, I was present to assist with some paperwork afterwards, but, but pretty much that is the story. If I wasn't there with my Jupiter in the eighth house, it could have gone so much more disastrous. He would have fallen. He could have bled right where he had fallen. He would have. He would have. This I know for sure. If I hadn't been there, he, he would have bled. This is why the medication question was so important to me. And it had, and it's really stuck with me because he ended up bleeding out in the hospital because they didn't know that he was on a blood thinner. And I didn't know he was on a blood thinner. If the medics had hours to go through all of those pill bottles on his table, kitchen table, I don't know if there were more things hiding somewhere else. How would we have known? So he would have probably bled out right then and there. He was having a hard time getting up. I don't think he could have gotten up. He was severely overweight. Um, and this wife of his, I don't know, would she, she somehow got out of that bed and into her wheelchair. So electric scooter. So I would say that she probably would have either gotten out of the bed and into the wheelchair and would have discovered him on the floor, which would have been emotionally horrendous for her. Or she would have been stuck in bed and would have had to wait for that niece or some other family member to call her to check in and be like, hey, how you doing? Talking about this story has really helped me to understand that role as of Jupiter that I was able to bring into the scenario of just, okay, these things have happened. Now, how can we make it just? There's no need for additional pain and suffering. How can we just make what's happening in the scenario as just as possible? Well, thank you for listening to me share my story and unravel some of how Jupiter is behaving in my eighth house and how you know, how I approach this eighth house of, of death and letting go and the consequences of, of these changes. Like how, how, how have I brought a level of just compassion? Well, that's what these stories are, are here for me to do, to help me unravel 
my understanding of the eighth house and to use that to expand to have a better understanding of the eighth house in general. So I will be making more videos like this. And if you like them, share a story. I want to hear your stories about the eighth house because death and dying isn't what we think it is. And life isn't what we think it is. And the worst thing that people say is on their deathbed that they didn't live enough. So what does that even mean? You know, what are we here to do? Are we here to do anything or are we here to be something? And this story alone just tells me that I was just there to be there. I was, I, I'm here to be there. I was just, I was there just to be there. I was there just to make sure that this transition didn't just leave like, it was, it could have been, it would have, would have been so messy, would have been so messy. And I was just there to make sure that it happened in a nice, neat, emotionally compassionate and loving way. So thank you and uh, stay tuned for the next story.